Hello and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm delighted to have Chris Ortolano, who is the founder of Outbound Edge and also the community manager and founder of SalesStack. And that's called Shift Happens. Let me spell that for you. S-I-H-I-F-T happens. Chris, would you mind giving us a quick introduction to who you are and your journey thus far? Marcus, I am so happy to be joining you from the Oregon coast. It's absolutely stunning out here. And my role as a community leader has led me to so many challenging problems. So what I try to do is create knowledge bases. And I think knowledge is the foundation of decision-making. And so what I do is I work with teams to identify who their customers are and create playbooks to help them understand the customer that they're trying to engage with and the decisions that those customers need to make. Marcus, I'm looking forward to exploring how we can empower and enable not only uh, sellers, but buyers to make better decisions. Fabulous. Okay, this is going to be a fun-filled experience for both of us. I'm not sure how much the audience is going to enjoy it because I think that we're going to have to challenge them a lot. So let me ask you this. What are the four most common questions people ask you about developing playbooks? Well, they want to know how to make shift happen, how to, how to make change. And quite honestly, I don't think salespeople are prepared to make any changes at all because they're entirely self-serving. Uh-huh. I, I'm with you on that. Okay, so um, let, let's uh, go on to the second question that they ask. So the next question is how to tell a compelling story. And many people like to consume stories. You'll enjoy a great movie, read a great book, but you have no idea how to actually create or craft a tale. Okay. Also a fantastically important question. And third question. How to understand data. Many of us are driven by data, but we have no idea where it comes from, how it's organized, or what the underlying themes are with related to data. So we we tend to believe things that are in print without questioning it. Yeah, funny thing about stuff that's in print and also data. Um, I have um, a controversial view on that, which we'll explore. And your fourth question? The fourth question is to how to create a personal mission with your own life and for your own career. Because without that, you're going to get tossed around like a, a, a piece of driftwood in the ocean. Okay, interesting. Let's start with the first controversial point that you made, that most salespeople are self-serving. I absolutely 100% agree. I think very few understand the difference between service and selfishness and being subservient. So what is service? Well, service is understanding the dynamics at play. So if you're in politics, for example, you need to understand both sides of an opinion and try and find some common ground in order to pass a measure, if you will, to provide a positive outcome. But in order to do that, you have to reconcile both sides of the issue. And I call that having a productive disagreement. Well, on the subject of productive disagreement, we're seeing a lot of unproductive disagreement going on at the moment. So let's explore how we can find ways to create productive disagreement. Yeah. So what are your lessons? Humans are naturally how do we say, irritable, Uh, because (laughs) as a species, we've learned to thrive via groupthink, this banding together of tribes, and then tribes have territories, and they defend those territories. However, in the modern age, we also have massive amounts of information and limited resources, and we need to optimize those resources based on the data that we have. So in order to disagree with you, Marcus, first, I have to validate your point of view. I have to give you the room to explain everything that you feel and to acknowledge it. Otherwise, we're not even going to have an agreement to disagree. Would you agree that that's a good first step? I think that's a, an excellent first step. We have, we have to acknowledge that the other person's view is valid in their mind and that we need to understand why they think that way and where the gaps are and where our common ground is. If we don't understand that, then we're probably going to approach it with a closed mindset, which means that it's going to become adversarial very quickly. And then it's a them versus us instead of finding out where we agree and where the areas are that we may need to come closer or fall back. So I've worked for and with many companies that see the customer as the adversary. 
They right. see the customer as a target. And when things don't go according to plan, they blame the customer. My friend Amy Woodall is an expert in customer service, and she says, the customer's not always right, but when they're wrong, it's often your fault. Absolutely, because we have blinders on. We can't see inside. We don't have the ability to walk in the customer's shoes unless we allow ourselves to do that. So that's really the first step is understanding who you're talking to because guess what? It creates an opening for them to want to understand you. So this then plays to Stephen Covey, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Mark Galston says, all human beings want to be heard, feel felt, and be understood. And if you do not approach the customer by thinking as them instead of about them, then chances are you're going to be approaching it from a selfish perspective. And uh, certainly the research that's coming out from Rod Jefferson, from uh, Mark Schaefer, from Matthew Sweezy is absolutely clear. Corporate visions have some beautiful research on this as well. And I think too few salespeople spend enough time trying to understand how customers got to where they are, why they got to the situation that they're in, and how they are collectively being impacted by those situations, which means that if you start with the premise that you're there to sell them something and you're fixated on talking about your company, your products, your services, you're going to miss the mark because when you're talking, you are learning nothing. Thoughts? Great. The best way to start to learn is to tell a story. Because a story shifts the way we perceive each other. It actually creates much more of a collaborative environment if you can tell a two-way story. That is a story that also inspires you or your audience to tell their story. It's interesting. The research coming out of Corporate Visions, for example, they have two, well, they have several distinct stories. But one is a why change story. And another one is a why stay story. And if you use the wrong story or you time it incorrectly, then chances are your story will backfire. So it's really important that we understand that 60% of buying cycles end in the status quo. So there's that awful piece of research that says that 60% of the buying journey has already been completed by the time they invite in a salesperson, which I've always thought was rot. It just tells me that the salespeople haven't spent enough time investigating and speaking to their prospects and their customers to understand where they are. And of the 40% that do buy, it's the ones that tell the displacement story best early in the cycle that win, which means that Otherwise, you're going to be spending your time on 10.4% of pursuits where you have a one in four uh, chance of winning, which means that if you're in those bid cycles and you're not telling them those displacement stories, you have a 2.6% probability of winning a sales cycle. And yeah, that's let's talk shocking. about the timing, right? You can't just roll up on somebody and tell them a displacement story. They're not ready for it. You have to set the stage first. You have to understand the backstory. And to do that, we need to do three things. We need to learn how to facilitate. Good. Okay. We need to learn how to collaborate. And then we need to learn how to disagree. And we need to do that within the buying committee. We're actually managing change within the buying committee, independent of our stated needs or goals. So if I'm working with you and the seven or eight people that you represent, I need to understand the dynamics inside that committee because they're challenging. You all probably have never had an opportunity to productively disagree before because one person has all the seniority and one person usually makes the decisions, even if they're horrible decisions. So tell me this then, what do we need to do to facilitate? We need to understand the the underlying problems. Many times people are solving for the wrong problem. As you and I talked about earlier, We typically abdicate our problem solving to technology, thinking that some new shiny object is going to somehow magically make a lot of our data problems go away, when in fact, they just compound the data problems. Okay. And once we've done that, how do we deploy a certain amount of data literacy? 
data literacy means understanding how data is related. Uh, many of us live in a marketing world or a sales world or a success world, but the customer doesn't see any of that. The customer has certain outcomes that they need to achieve. So we as sellers need to challenge what those outcomes are. Do they really need another tool? Maybe they need a better decision-making process. Maybe they need to understand their competitors better. I think by asking those questions, we start to develop a partnership, which leads to trust, which leads to having these dynamic disagreements. At that point, we can stop start to solve for the right problems. I think you've touched on something that's really important here as well. Partners help each other get better. It doesn't mean that they agree. It often means that they have constructive conflict and that they disagree. They hold each other's feet to the fire and they can often have stand-up fights over stuff. But once they have agreed a course of action, in order to achieve the common purpose, then they back it. And this, again, is where I see an awful lot of uh, waste because people are afraid of conflict. They're afraid of it inviting um, people to disagree. And so what they do is they brush stuff under the carpet, they tolerate uh, poor performance, they capitulate. And actually what customers need very often, and bear in mind, as salespeople, we are speaking to dozens, hundreds, thousands of people just like them. We are better placed than they are very often to bring them insight. And we need to be doing that. We need to ask questions that deliver insight. Because your average salesperson asks questions to gather information, selfishly. A few will ask questions to gain understanding. And you do have to understand, but very, very few. And I would put it maybe half a percent of salespeople genuinely ask questions that deliver insight, that rip the scales from the prospect's eyes or the customer's eyes and make them see the world through a clear, different lens because they rip off the blinkers, the blinders, and they have them see the world differently. You know what's really hard to talk about? Go on. It's risk. Uh, Absolutely. And there's inherent risk. I mean, if we look at the different types of risk that buyers are facing, We need to be looking at the risks that the stakeholders are facing. We need to look at the challenges and the problems that they're trying to resolve and the risks associated with that. There's the commercial and financial risk. And then we've got decision-making risk. And all of those are things that most salespeople, frankly, are illiterate on. And most buyers are too. That's fair. So we need to introduce risk that also provides assurance. If I say to you, we're going to go on a trip and you might want trip insurance, you might feel more comfortable if that trip were delayed and you couldn't make to your hotel. The assurance piece allows us to introduce risk in a way that is less unsettling, that creates less anxiety. However, we have to acknowledge the risks, especially in these times. I think there's uh, another element that we have to factor in here, which is how sales organizations, vendors are managed and how KPIs and targets and quarterly reporting get in the way of really effective buyer-seller relationships. Because if you're under pressure to hit your quota and your managers are pressing you to try and get a deal in over the line no matter what, then what you're doing is you're trying to force the buyer to make a decision prematurely. And more often than not, they'll just dig in their heels. And whatever you've offered them and uh, to try and bribe them into making a decision sooner will then backfire because when they're ready to make the decision, they'll be expecting those concessions, which you needn't have given away. That means that you've given away margin. You've probably taken on a problem that you could have easily have prevented or avoided in the first place. And you then have to live with that for one, three, five, ten years. And that's a huge, huge mistake. The way we sell is a huge opportunity for improvement on both sides. And it does shift how we engage in our discovery process from, I would call, an inquisition (laughs) or sort of an interrogation towards more of a consultative approach to understand what the dynamics and potential for change inside an organization is. Many times we hear only the signals that we want to hear to support the closed date and the high probability, but there's also negative signals. And so we need to move into what Sherrod Verma calls the white white space and do a risk analysis on the opportunity 
independent of some perceived closed date. Interesting. So again, I think a part of this is also driven on the vendor side and probably the buyer side as well by the data overwhelm. I think, and this is a topic that I'd be curious to uh, your thoughts on. I, I think we've fallen into the trap of believing the rhetoric of vendors that have said it's all about big data, you've got to capture all this information. And what I'm seeing increasingly is it's alienating and distancing potential problem solvers from the people who have the problem. And all of that data, that fixation on big data and the technology that underpins it. And so I'm asking people this question. I would love to hear back from the audience on this. What is the minimum amount of technology that you can have in your operation, in your sales and marketing operation, in order to be able to do your job well and serve your customers outstandingly, um, develop a human relationship with them? Because automation, chatbots, automated email, marketing automation, uh, sales automation, all of that stuff, I think is actually a negative. I've yet to see a great example of where that stuff does more good than harm. Well, usually we automate the wrong behavior. Go on. You see it, you certainly see it in sales and what we call sales development, where we're essentially accelerating some kind of outreach that does not lead to any new understanding of the customer. To simply set a meeting for a demo does little to drive insight or awareness into the problems that the customer is trying to solve. And more often than not, that demo is to someone who can say no or maybe, but can't say yes. And it's done. Yeah, from- they don't need the demo because they can generally figure out what your product does. What we really should be doing is driving a root cause analysis and asking five really critical questions. One, what is the problem? And two, why is it a problem? Okay. Three, who owns the process that's related to the problem? Four, what other problems do they have to solve? And five, what are the desired outcomes? If you sent me an email sequence that asked me those five questions, I would reply. It's really interesting. When David Sander originally developed his pain funnel questions, they were, what's the biggest problem that you face? What is it about that problem you find most difficult? What keeps you from your intended outcome? What does the obstacle do to prevent you from achieving your intended outcome, how, and what do you do today, and what do you want to do about it? And this was 47, 50 years ago, but we've gone away from that, which I I think is a huge mistake. And I see it time and again, which is why last year, only 13% of sales teams, I believe, on the basis of the research, actually hit their quota. Only 44% of individual sales reps hit their quota in 2019. Now, I suspect 2020 is going to be substantially worse than that. So what does it tell you? Is the increase in technology is actually not helping to improve win rates. So what do we have to do about that? We need to change the way we think about problem solving. Tell me more. There's a sixth question that we need to ask, which is who else is responsible for solving that problem? Because right now, the silos inside of companies, especially tech companies, are starting to break down. And we see a lot more cross-functional teams, but that cross-functionality has not really enabled proper decision-making. So you have politics, you have lack of information, you have misleading information inside of organizations that hinder them from making good decisions, especially in times of crisis during COVID-19. Well, I think part of this is the legacy and tradition of where leadership comes from. In most organizations, the route to the chief executive's office was either the CFO or the VP of sales. And I think neither of those are best positioned to really understand in most organizations. There are a few glimmers of hope. But I think increasingly where we will see leaders emerging will be from the uh, channel chiefs because they really have to understand And their profile actually is much closer to a chief executive. It is to a a VP of sales. 
I think you'll see it in the uh, head of data analytics, the ones that aren't technical, the ones that have that big picture approach. I think the ones, uh, the chiefs of user and customer experience and partner experience will be where uh, you'll start seeing the, the new breed of leaders emerge. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I'm bringing three of those very specific titles into a shift happens in about 10 days because I do think that you need to fuse the different data, the customer experience, and the revenue elements together. But I also feel like everybody in a leadership role needs to embrace three key words. I don't know. Absolutely. Okay, that's all. And what happens is everybody then gets a chance to contribute what they do know. We call that a team of rivals approach. It was made famous by Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s. Since then, we've gotten Donald Trump, which is the exact opposite. And so what does that tell you about our evolution? Is that we need to to learn quickly how to create a collaborative decision-making process in order to address and resolve complex problems. One person at the top of the food chain cannot do it alone. Absolutely. And again, this brings me to the next point, and I don't want to get dragged into a political conversation because I suspect we could go on for hours. Um, (laughs) But ego is the enemy. When I see great leaders, they are egoless. They put their ego aside. They're vulnerable. They're nurturing. They're empathic. But they can make a decision and they can assert their authority and they can galvanize teams of people to solve difficult, thorny problems. Where you have leaders whose egos are involved, they play the victim. It's not fair. People don't love me. They play the persecutor and they punish and they stifle risk-taking and they stifle creativity. And then the other element of that could be rescuing, which is helping without boundaries or permission, which is micromanaging, it's interfering, it creates upward delegation, and it's also incredibly disempowering because people think, well, Chris is going to do it anyway, why should I bother? And then yeah. what, the, what happens is then uh, rescuers tend to tolerate non-performance. Whereas if you look at the best leaders, I've got another podcast, uh, the Scale-Ups and Hypergrowth podcast, mm. and on there we've interviewed some of the world's best sales leaders who've been leading their companies to massive growth. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of percent growth. And they're doing so without everything falling apart. Because as they go through that growth, uh, that massive growth spurt, what tends to happen is you get this backlog where sales gets ahead of everything, then operations suffers, and then customer service suffers, and recruitment suffers, and customers leave and because of customer complaints, and so on. And I I think what we need is to simplify our businesses, remove the complication. Complexity is fine, so long as you understand that when you're trying to implement a change program, that everybody needs to be aligned towards the common purpose. The people who are not, then you need to understand why. And is it because they cannot or will not change? Or is it because they have a valid argument to counter what you're trying to achieve? And if you haven't got everybody uh, working towards that common purpose at some point, then what you're going to end up with is people just throwing spanners in the works. And that's why 88% of change programs fail. My pal, Eddie Oben, has a 96% success rate in change programs, which is unheard of. But his approach is one that is collegiate. Everybody gets involved, the non-English speakers, the introverts, and uh, he helps people to address their hopes and fears right at the beginning of each exchange. And very often, where people's ego is in the way, they don't allow that, and they don't allow challenge. And net result of that is that you end up with people uh, being resentful, and simmering resentment seems to be more the norm in these type of organizations? Yeah, there's a few exceptions, and they tend to characterize three key elements. The first is to democratize the data. What does Many that of us mean? want to know the underlying trends associated with change inside our own organizations. We need to create an open book process where everybody can see the key metrics that are driving change 
inside the different organizations, uh, pardon me, departments, and then create a shared decision-making process. Okay. And what's the other two elements? Democratize the data, which is create a data literacy program inside your organization so that you understand the difference between information, knowledge, and decision-making, right? Many of us tend to hone in on a particular trend line. We think, oh, this is it. You know, the number of uh, lead to SQLs is rising. Well, there's assumptions baked into that. So let's look at the assumptions that characterize how we perceive information and try and figure out what the, the knowledge is that we need to change to make any kind of progress. The second is to create an open book environment. Could you imagine a TV screen inside a company where all the key metrics or all the key OKRs are published and that we could read that the way we read a newspaper? It would be amazing. And then the third is to have a shared decision-making process where we can sit around in a room and critique each other's assumptions. That's where the best ideas come from. However, when we work in a culture of fear, where you have a few people at the top who are responsible for increasing market share and serving shareholders, what it does is it discounts all the ideas that everybody else has. Interestingly, we're starting to see a trend, and we saw it last year, a JP Morgan event, I think it was, where um, there was an announcement that instead of focusing on shareholder value, people are going to focus on customer satisfaction, which is long overdue. Because if the customers aren't satisfied, they'll talk with their feet. And I think compensation is another area that we have to look at in terms of we need to look at how do we create long-lived customer relationships where customers are satisfied and happy over time. Um, Because when you think about the cost of customer acquisition, we're talking, depending on which research you're looking at, it's anywhere between six to nine where I've seen uh, research that says 15 to 21 times more expensive to bring on a new customer than sell to an existing one. And if you're not focused on customer retention and customer satisfaction, then the chances of you expanding those accounts is very limited. And we also need to get away from this idea of rapid growth and not focusing on producing businesses with good fundamentals and that generate profit. I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about the private equity and venture capital market, which we might have. You're, you're challenging the assumptions of private equity and venture capital, which are to deliver an exit as quickly as possible for the investors, irregardless of the business fundamentals, and certainly irregardless of the customers. Well, when you look at the number of businesses that make it to IPO, although in fairness, that has shrunk, because increasingly what we're seeing is because the model seems to be broken, what they're doing is they're doing backroom deals where one private equity company sells a company to another private equity company on the basis that next year, we're going to buy two of your companies so that we can create the exit. And that's creating a false marketplace. And I think investors are being diddled. That's insider trading. Yeah, pretty much. We live in a boom-bust economy and have for probably... 2,500 years. But the limit to that type of economic model is quickly approaching. And so until we learn to manage the limitations, if you will, on uh, economic growth, we're going to be subject to that boom-bust model. And there will be a few winners always. But now, increasingly, we see more and more losers, people who are retiring without enough equity or people who fail in their startup ventures. Failure is most, much more common than success in startups. I suspect it always will be because you know, starting up a business that's successful is difficult. It's simple, but it's tough. My question comes back to the, uh, my original question. How do you create a personalized playbook? Because I, I think that's really interesting because a, a lot of playbooks that we see being developed are you know, cookie cutter, one size fits all. And I think one of the themes that I'm sure I heard it on one of the Shift Happens posts is that you need to create personalized playbook by the customer that maps their journey. And I think that that's such an innovative and almost heretical perspective because to, to many, that smacks of a lot of hard work. Well, you know Lisa Palmer. Absolutely. Raving. Uh, Yeah, she's very talented. and, And has created a process that she calls a visual dartboard, which basically asks 
hey, are we in the ballpark? And that dartboard then solicits a response from everybody in the buying committee that says, well, yes, no. And you start to shape the solution based on their response. My point is that you can go through a five or a six step process that involves these visual dartboards that does not push a product. It actually solicits a response that allows you to, to determine what their priorities are. So most um, decision makers have three key things that they're focused on. The first is risk. Okay, The risk associated with change is the biggest barrier. And that's why we see no decision, because we have not been assured, which is the second element. We need to provide proof points. And then the third thing is the most difficult, which is the decision-making process. Marcus, if you and I are both on a buying committee, you prefer product A and I prefer product B, how do we reconcile those differences? Many times we don't know how to do that. So we can use a stacked ranking or a weighted factor analysis. These are not that complicated, but we need to understand that decision-making is just as difficult as the problem solving process. And I think that's where salespeople in particular fall apart. They show up and then they start to identify problems and then they sit back. They take a step back during the decision making process. And if the buying committee can't do that, that's when the decision, uh, when the deal just starts to go dark. Well, this then points to another major area that I think sales enablement needs to be involved in, but I don't think there's anywhere near enough emphasis, which is on business acumen and business savvy. Because unless you understand how your prospect or your customer's business operates, what the driving factors are, what they're trying to achieve, uh, who the cast of characters is, uh, what the commercial and internal political pressures are, um, where they are in their life cycle, where the individuals are within their job cycle, are they startup? To, uh, continuation, growth, turnaround, or recovery, um, where their market is, what the competitive landscape is. And when, when you're dealing with these complex, sophisticated purchases that are strategic, and they could be make or break, now, if you're changing the ERP system or you're changing to a virtual environment or uh, you're trying to migrate from legacy to cloud, these can make or break the business. And the compulsion to do nothing must be enormous where if you haven't mitigated those risks and given them that assurance. Because if you look at the research on this, if you haven't been able to identify the buyer's preferences and found a way to mitigate that, and you haven't been able to understand what the cost of inaction and the cost of no change, you know, cost of staying the same will be, if you haven't created enough contrast between what you're offering and what the competition is offering and what the status quo is, and you haven't anticipated and put to bed the fear that their amygdala will be running about the potential regret and blame of the wrong decision, then chances are either it will go to a bid if you're lucky, or more often than not, just nothing will happen. Yeah, I agree. You need to create a compelling moment, if you will, a compelling need. But I think you can also do that via a needs analysis. If you and I can agree to some proof of concept and define success metrics, I think that's the true discovery process. It's not about finding pain. It's about defining success metrics and then a timeline or implementation to essentially prove the hypothesis. I think that's where a lot of us fall down is we, we see it as a binary model. We're either going to invest 100% or not, when in fact, we should be running little tests with our buyers to evaluate what the uh, data is telling us and then to encourage them to critique that data. Very interesting. Tell me this, what are the three questions that people should be asking you, but they're not? How to measure white space. Great question. Yep. So I ran a shift happens with Sharad Verma and a gentleman named Navid Afo Gandhi. Don't get me wrong. Uh, pardon, Navid, if I messed up your last name. He's at Branch, VP of Sales. And what they were doing was a pipeline analysis based on all the seller's assumptions. And what they did is they flipped that using a tool called BoostUp to evaluate the risk factors. And those factors came from the recorded conversations, the emails, the calendar invites. 
And what they did is they started to change the way they thought about opportunities by saying, what don't we know? And that changed many, many aspects of their sales process. By continuing to critique what they don't know, they were able to fill in the gaps and that changed them relative to their competitors. That's all they had to do was get 10% better by asking the right questions at the right times. But if they had stuck with the classic opportunity, close rate, probability, that stuff, they would have never found that. But they had to create what, what Sherrod calls a risk intelligence mindset, which is a willingness to ask what they don't know and to accept that fact and to push the envelope of what they don't know every single time they had a deal review or a stakeholder engagement to further increase the white space. That's fascinating. And I do want to come back to that in a second. What's the second question that people should be asking but don't? The second question should be really about what their OKRs could be. Can you define OKR for people? Yeah, objective and key reporting. And there's a gentleman named, I believe it's John Doerr, D-O-E-R-R, who wrote a book called Measure What Matters. Uh, He's with a big PC, Finer Perkins, former Intel. And what he did is he crafted Andy Grove, former CEO of Intel's basically management process, to essentially create a series of OKRs that can all roll up into the organizational objectives. And an OKR is really like a personal mission statement and a team mission statement and a department mission statement that has a series of activities and metrics that are associated with it. Now, it's different than a KPI. A KPI is basically the data that drives the mission. And I think what we need to do is own a certain set of activities, own a certain set of data, and know what that's how that aligns with the corporate objectives. Many people don't know what the corporate objectives are at all. And they're just running little activity shops inside a business, hoping that it somehow aligns with a greater goal. But let, let me ask you this then. How often are the OKRs selfish rather than understanding and focused on the customer? It depends how siloed the organization is. So I think two-thirds of the time, they're not focused because they see the customer essentially as a means to an end, as opposed to a partner, if you will. So if there's a shift, and this is what I'm trying to determine right now, is how my OKRs can correlate to the customer's OKRs. Can I actually help them to understand the value of setting clear OKRs? If so, once they've determined that, can I help them achieve those OKRs? That is the ultimate partnership. This is really interesting. I interviewed uh, an old friend of mine. He was my AE 18 years ago, and I, I was setting meetings for him uh, when I was a young whippersnapper sales guy. And uh, he's just closed a $100 million deal, and there were 12 partners involved, and goodness knows how many vendors. And what he was able to do because he was focused on having conversations with each of the partners and with the customers is he was able to find the common ground, coordinate all of them, and using the relationship with the partners to accelerate access to the key stakeholders and key decision makers. He was able to knock months off this deal and exclude the competition. And that, I think, is what we really need to focus on. This is what the best salespeople are doing because they recognize that their job is coordination, it's collaboration. It's not, I mean, the selling part is maybe 10% of their job. Most of it is rigorous planning, strategic thinking, coordinating, making sure that the right people are having the right conversations in the right way with the right people at the right time, making sure that peer-to-peer conversations are happening. One of the biggest challenges that they face, and this came through, in other conversations with really uh, successful enterprise salespeople is the biggest challenge is internal very often. It's dealing with the silos, dealing with the politics, dealing with the egos, and making sure that you as a vendor are actually working in concert and working towards common purpose. Now, when when I uh, interviewed Tom Shodorf and uh, Ryan Longfield and uh, Jim Legg, These guys were absolutely focused on making sure that everyone was working in concert. They were spending an inordinate amount of time. I mean, these are CEOs and uh, CROs spending 50% of their time plus speaking to customers. I think there's two things you need to do that successfully. The first is what I call complex 
team selling. Yeah. And you absolutely need a playbook in order to coordinate or orchestrate the individuals on both sides of the conversation. The second is you do need some type of intelligence to listen and hear the buying signals. The buying signals are there in the conversations, the emails, the meetings, but we often fail to hear the complete range of signals. And so if you have both of those, then you can start to weave both sides of the table together. And I, I, Martin Lindstrom talks about this as being small data, listening for the small clues that tell you where the trends are, where the real leverage points are. I think we've been seduced away from that. And one of the critical skills, I think, that so few salespeople really possess is genuine listening skill. And what I'm flabbergasted by is that there is not more emphasis on this. From day one, teaching people how to listen, because we don't learn that at school. We learn how to just absorb um, and at university, we're taught maybe a little bit of critical thinking, but I don't think there is anywhere near enough emphasis on the whole skill of listening. I've talked my way out of many a sale. I've never listened my way out of one. <laughs> well, I have a secret to share with you. Please. Which is that I have learned many of these things, not in a sales environment, but actually working in a local political environment through a local city council. and urban growth task forces, where you are faced with immense amounts of pressure, and you have to hear all the different opinions to understand what the potential solutions are. It's very different than a sales process. Well, I interviewed one of the most interesting guests I've ever had on my show, a guy called Patrick Lindqvist. And he is responsible, he, he is the chief innovation advisor for the city of Helsingborg in Sweden. And for those of you who listen to the podcast, please look him up. And I'll put the link in the blurb uh, for this one. And what's really interesting is with a very small budget, I mean, he's got $25 million to turn the city into a center of innovation by 2022. And he's got to coordinate with the city elders, the elected officials, the budget holders, all the people who scrutinize public spending, stakeholders, users of public transport, users of um, education, users of elder care, and being able to coordinate all of that. And what, what, one of the things that he's done, which is just, it's depressing that he has to do it, but uh, it's a really insightful step forward, is he's created a position called manager of the gap. And their job is to manage the gaps between the silos. And I think too few organizations really think like that. When he recruited his team for transport, he recruited not one transport specialist. He only recruited users. And what was really interesting from that was they just told it as they saw it. You know, if you're a user of public transport, this is what you didn't like. This is what you did like. This is what you want. And the... Stuff that they've done in primary education has been fascinating. Listening to children of primary school age and listening to what they want, that takes a real patience and a real humility to learn from stakeholders like that. And I think- Well, you're talking about small data. Absolutely. And how cool would it be if marketing had some resources to be always listening for small data? You're not going to find me fight you on that um, because I, I th you know, to be perfectly honest, I think most marketing spend utterly wasted. You'd be better off buying lottery tickets or just heating the fire with it, with the money that you're spending for the return that you're getting. And yeah, you we've just digitized an outdated awareness campaign. In fact, the small data will lead us to the, the right opportunities. And I think building on that, Listening not only to the small data, but finding ways to encourage your customers to talk about you. Because the best interaction that happens on social media is the stuff that's customer generated. It's not the stuff that's being spewed out by marketing departments. Very few marketing departments have any return above 1% or 2% on their digital marketing. No, because they're paying Google to compete with others who are paying Google. $265 billion a year spent on advertising that generates zero interaction on Google and Facebook. Sounds now, like a race to the bottom. 
Yeah, pretty much. But the, the real problem is it handicaps the seller because we do not have operational content. We do not have content to engage the buyer on their terms to assess the problems that they have and the severity of those problems. So the seller is forced to create ad hoc materials, which then live locally and are not transferred with others inside the organization. So that then raises the question, how do we create an environment which is a learning organization within the sales environment? We need to come together and basically transfer these stories. I think stories are the vehicle for opening and knowledge transfer. And you can, like Vidyard, for example, they will have a customer story competition every Friday. And people spend the first part of the week figuring out how to tell a good backstory, figuring out who the character is, what their journey is. And then they, it's like a battle rap. They'll go in front of the room and tell the story and people will cheer or boo. There'll be prizes. There's a sense of pride. But the, the fact is it, it, it shifts the narrative away from the company to the customer. Well, we see this in case studies. I don't know how many I've seen that, frankly, they should never have been published because they do more harm to your brand than good. And yeah. as Steve Jobs said it beautifully, a brand is just trust. It's whether the, uh, the customer trusts you or not. And they trust you to do or say or behave in a particular way. And too often when we see companies investing in corporate social responsibility, it's a tick in the box. It's not something that they live or mean. You look at the Nike campaign last, uh, last year with the sports people taking a knee, and they, they took a massive risk there. They knew that it would alienate a proportion of their market. But they also have a lot of small data to suggest that young people in particular are ready to basically embrace diversity and have a huge appetite for that. Absolutely. Uh, and it's appealed to 90% of their customers. So they sacrificed yeah. the 10 yeah. who found it offensive and grew their standing with the 90% who continue to buy their products. And the net result of that is they earned loyalty and they earned the faith of their customers. And yeah. that's something that is sadly lacking. If we had a metric for loyalty and faith, then marketing, sales, even success would, would look vastly different. So we need to tr create a different dashboard that includes more metrics than just revenue. But right now, if you look at any kind of you know, sales dashboard, it's all about profit for the company. It's not about gain or profit for the customer. We need to have a second dashboard that speaks to customer value. Well, what we really need to understand is that revenue and profit are a byproduct of serving the customer. Revenue, profit, number of dials, number of proposals, number of demos, none of that stuff actually serves the vendor organization to get better. All it Could you imagine having Zoom calls with your customers every day just to understand what their challenges are and how they're overcoming them? That would be a massive uplift in terms of knowledge transfer, because then we basically transfer those stories, A, to our prospects, and B, inside our own organization. We need more of those on our you know, all-hands meetings, less uh, talking heads telling us about you know, GDP and all this other stuff. Well, th what's missing, I think, is a vulnerability to have those conversations, because they can be very uncomfortable. When you realize that you're not serving the customer and that your great new shiny widget isn't going to be something that they want. I mean, I, I see so much waste because marketing and product development teams develop product in isolation from the customer rather than with them. Marketing doesn't spend anywhere near enough time speaking to the customer. My pal Mark Schaefer does hundreds, thousands of um, events and Fewer than 20 in a room of 5,000 of marketeers in one uh, instance had actually spoken to a customer in the last 12 months. Yeah. I mean, well, I can tell you, as a former developer, right? I used to write code. Customers are messy, right? They can't always agree internally. They don't know how to solve problems properly. It's like having, you know, 150 little kids running around. But yet, that is where we need to be spending more of our time. Now, what's interesting, I run some podcasts on a regular basis with a, a three fantastic storytellers 
So Paul Alexandru has been working with Kahoot over the last few years. Now, Kahoot's a $2 million a year turnover business with a billion unique users, 70 million daily users. And that's been built on story. Martin Lucas uh, runs a company called Gap in the Matrix, and they specialize in using mathematical psychology to understand what drives the behavior of buyers. And Alex Moscow, who is the best PR I've ever come across, and what he does, he specializes in telling the customer's story on behalf of his clients. Now, an observation that those guys made was that if you want to really get the customer's story, speak to the people at the extremes. Speak to the raving fans and speak to the people who hate you, who fired you, because they can express what they feel more clearly than the people in the middle. And then also look for people whose behavior has changed recently. Have they stopped doing something or started doing something? And then find out why and find out what those catalysts were. Because it doesn't have to be as messy as all that. Because if you're speaking to the middle layer, then chances are you're going to get a lot of uh, conjecture and you know, unclear information. But well, you mentioned case studies, right? That's speaking to the middle. What we often fail to hear is the backstory which is what was happening prior to our customer using our product. They were lost. They were trying things. They were forks in the road. That's where your prospects are. So our stories really need to embrace what I call the backstory. And that's like any great movie or opera. There's always a lead in that creates uncertainty. Nancy Duarte calls that the spark line, the tension. You can create tension that's good. And that's what we need to understand about these stories. It's a series of decisions with doubt and risk, and then finally some assurance. And that's what compels people to make changes in their lives. If you've listened to the podcast, you'll have heard about this before. If you haven't, this will be new to you. There's a wonderful five-stage agenda called Recon. Remember or remind me, evaluate, changed opportunities, next steps. So remind me what it was like before we started working together. Uh, remember what we agreed to do between now and the last time we spoke. Evaluate is where you invite negative feedback. Is there anything that we have failed to do, any promise we've failed to keep, any expectation we've failed to meet? Then changed is what's improved, what's worked for the better. And there I want hard data. I want to know whether you're more efficient, more resilient, more profitable, quicker, faster, cheaper, I want pounds, shillings, and pence. I want percentages. Then where are the opportunities over the next 30, 60, 90, 120 days for us to work more closely together to serve you better? And what are the next steps? And if your salespeople and your marketing teams are having those regular conversations, you will get those backstories. And when you hear a good backstory, then arrange to have a more detailed conversation. And it's incumbent on us as providers as partners with our customers to invite those stories because they want to tell them. It serves them well. In many ways, Marcus, this is the aha moment for me because we are plagued in here in the US, probably in the UK as well, with a constant tendency to check in and touch base. But oh. you have just shared with me the recon approach, which is critical for working with potential customers who are not yet in the buying window but to engage with them on some process. And the recon process is clearly the best way to go beyond just, hey, how's it going? Or I haven't heard from you, which is a horrible way to build a relationship. Okay, look, we're coming to the top of the hour. Um, I'd love to have this conversation again, um, or uh, a more detailed conversation with you if you're up for it. Tell me this, what, what are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with at the moment, Chris? This is kind of meta, but COVID-19 is a significant unknown, and many companies don't know how to navigate. And so if you are truly going to be a partner, we need to understand the vertical uh, and then the different sub-verticals that are changing. Right now, some sectors are growing. Uh, Telehealth is one example, but many sectors are struggling, uh, retail in particular. Uh, And so it's created a very... mm, Difficult way to forecast for hiring, training, providing for uh, economic growth is really subject to a lot of things. Most importantly, the election 
uh, here in the U.S. in 2020. I don't think we're going to see any resolution of uh, economic futures until perhaps January 20th of 2021. So just dealing with the level of uncertainty as well as the public health risk are, are you know, pretty significant challenges that many of us are facing. Absolutely. And I, I think with that, you've also got volatility, ambiguity, and all that doubt that's floating around as well. So again, I think one of the most important things we can do is actually uh, spend time listening to our customers and finding out what is really concerning them, what they're trying to do, um, and uh, identifying ways that if we can't help them, who else that we can? Uh, and I'm seeing resiliency that- is about having options, right? So we need to introduce a series of options to get people thinking. Because I can tell you, doing nothing right now could be the worst possible choice. Uh, absolutely, and often you know, playing it safe is the most lethal of outcomes. Or you know, there are certain industries, like education, right now is at risk. Uh, and so how do we mitigate? We have to take steps forward, but it may not be what we were used to in the past. Sending kids back to school right now may not be the best option. Uh, I'm with you on that. I mean, uh, we're being told that we're going to be fined £300, uh, £600 a day per child per day uh, if they don't go to school back in September. Now, that's £1,800 a day. I'm reluctant to send, or I've only got two now uh, that are going to school, but I'm reluctant to send them back, given the current circumstance, because if they get sick and they bring that home, that's going to be, you know, first of all, it could kill me. But more importantly, I don't want them to catch it. And, you know, I'm concerned. But anyway, let's let's park that, because that's probably going to drive Yeah, but my point is that that we need to rethink the problem, uh, which is, really about how to continue a young person's discovery and learning process. And there are many ways to do that. It's an opportunity to reframe the problem. Uh, And I think those are the things we should be talking about. Agreed. What are you um, being influenced by watching, reading, listening to at the moment? So as you uh, mentioned earlier, I did produce an event specifically for the revenue operations or RevOps audience. And what we're seeing is uh, essentially a definition of a group of people who are very technical. They're typically systems administrators who are hired for a strategic role and then quickly get pulled into very tactical problem solving. This is because data is poorly managed, systems are not integrated, and they end up essentially firefighting. And there's a missed opportunity, which is to set a vision for data analysis. So I'm hoping, praying, working with a few different people to essentially create a data literacy series of roundtable conversations where executives can learn to speak about data with their revenue operations leads to to create a common vision for the organization that's data-driven and less subjective. Uh, But this requires that executives understand the parameters of data, what an index is, how to measure uh, across a series of indexes, and to ask questions if they don't know the answers. Uh, so this is what we're, we're looking for. I'm looking forward to producing in the fall. Excellent. And if you had a golden ticket and you could whisper in the ear of the idiot Chris Apes 23, what mm-hmm. would you advise him? <laughs> I'd say always to have a plan B and maybe even a plan C, D, and E because things don't go according to plan. <laughs> Excellent. Chris, how can people get hold of you? Well, I'm very um, accessible on LinkedIn, LinkedIn LinkedIn.com. Sales Nerdo is my tag on Twitter. Uh, But most importantly, I run a community called Sales Stack, two S's in the middle, S-A-L-E-S-S-T-A-C-K.io. And that is one of many micro communities where we can start to hone in on some pretty critical elements that are related to growing an organization. Right now, we're looking at KPIs and OKRs. So if folks are curious about how to deploy those in those organizations, come by salesstack.io. Excellent. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, Marcus. This has been amazing. Excellent. So this is Marcus Cappy signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this a useful and insightful conversation, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to get in touch with either myself or with Chris, then you can email me on marcuscalkey at me.com or M-C-A-U-C-H-I at Sandler.com. And if you think you'd be a good guest or you know someone who'd be a good guest, then please put us in touch either via email or via LinkedIn. 
In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.